19th century architecture sees a lot of that technology, specifically steel construction, coming into play. Now, early on, anything that we would term a skyscraper is going to be built of stone. Basically, it is masonry construction, which means that the stone is going to be load bearing. Those walls, those stone walls are bearing the entire weight of the structure. We see that uh, in Chicago at the Monanoc, I probably destroyed that building. And the problem here is by the time you get to 10 stories and above, the building is incredibly heavy. And in fact, it starts to sink in this case due to that weight, due to settling. And so what we see is they start to look for ways to lighten the load. Thus, we get to the Tacoma building in about 1889. Now, what they do here is they're trying to create a fireproof building. Up until this point, public buildings had to be stone. The idea is that it's going to be more or less fireproof after the Great Chicago Fire and other giant fires. Of course, that's an important concern. So what they do with the Tacoma building is they start to use steel as the weight bearing material and then the masonry becomes a curtain on the outside so the masonry isn't actually load bearing anymore what this allows for is larger windows it allows for a larger structure because of course weight isn't as big of an issue until we get to really big buildings but that's a whole nother matter now, in terms of design, what they will do is they will start using what's called a tripartite construction. In other words, the building is built like a column. And so we have a capital at the top, we have a shaft in the middle, we have a base at the bottom, which is why the, the bottom of the building frequently looks different than the top of the building, mimicking that base and capital. They're also going to use Renaissance and Italian ideas of arcades and large openings here for all of the commercial space. The idea being you can have stores down here and then living space up above or offices or whatever else. Now, Chicago and New York kind of go back and forth between who's got the tallest buildings. Uh, Chicago is a great place for the American skyscraper to develop because it is, of course, there's no earthquakes or anything. Same in New York, but the taxes for a long time were lower in Chicago, so it drew people there. But one of the examples we see in New York is the Flatiron Building. We see that three-part construction, uh, tripart construction, where we have our base, our shaft, and our capital. Uh, and they're just looking for a way to deal with it. Remember, this is a brand new kind of structure. And here again, there's a steel structure underneath. The stone is all veneer. Now, there's a number of engineering issues that they're running into. Of course, the weight of the building, wind loads, and other things. So you're going to see these very slowly, especially over the 20th century, get lighter and lighter until we're building without any masonry and we're building things like the current Willis Tower or Sears Tower in Chicago, which are basically steel and glass construction. But it takes some time to get there. The public has to have confidence. The builders have to have confidence. A lot of things need to happen. And of course, you can't build any of these without the elevator to go up all these floors. No one wants to walk up 20, 30, 40 flights of stairs. Just trust me, it's not going to be pretty. One other thing that needs to happen is, of course, you need large panes of glass, which we haven't really had until this point. Now, in the 19th century, earlier in the 19th century, they develop this fantastic method of build, sorry, in the 17th century, they create a form of creating sheet glass. In other words, they blow basically a cylinder, they cut the end off of it, and then they cut it and flatten it. The problem is you get a lot of flaws in this. This is going to be very, very uneven. And if you've ever looked at old glass windows and you see they're very wavy, that's why. Or you see air bubbles and other things, that's why you're getting them. Now, by the time we get to the early 20th century, they're actually creating sheet glass in single sheets. Uh, this is possible because they start to realize that you can actually float the glass on top of molten metal, creating a perfectly smooth sheet of glass. And then as it comes off, they simply uh, cut or break it 
into the sheets that they need and walk away. And this is really effective. This is necessary for those massive glass storefronts or the massive glass windows that we have in pretty much every house that any of you live in today. Those are massive compared to what you would have seen early in earlier construction. 